With season 4 being extremely faithful to the material it's covering, there aren't many major cutscenes with which I can talk about. Where the anime does fall a bit behind though are the inner thoughts that really add to the tension of these desperate situations. Like, you don't really see just how close Bell was to falling into madness until you realize that he was literally hearing the dungeon laugh at him. So, as we look at things like that and the additional action from the Amphispina fight, I hope I can add a bit more context to exactly what everyone's been going through. A quick reminder, the Armory desk mat is still available. And now, let's talk about Donmachi. Episode 13, Morgue, covering chapters 7 and 9 from volume 14 of the Light Novel. Jumping straight back into Bell's dire situation, with the Juggernaut right behind him hunting its prey, Bell was going as fast as he could to try and lose it. He was constantly changing directions, traveling down whatever branching corridors were available to him. Despite there being significant risk of reaching a dead end or perhaps another monster, escaping the Juggernaut was all that mattered now. So, as he ran to the sound of footsteps approaching ever closer, Bell's mind started its descent into a panic unlike anything he'd ever experienced before. His mind filled with doubt as it questioned what the best course of action was. Then, with all sorts of pain preventing his brain from thinking clearly, the only thing Bell could rely on was his experience. He had unconsciously begun a charge in preparation for the inevitable encounter with the opponent chasing him, one that lasted 20 seconds before finally being cast as a desperate attempt at defending himself. Bell didn't visually see that the Juggernaut was that close, but its increasingly potent bloodlust was more than enough for him to know exactly when it was right behind him, leading to an attack that actually struck fear straight into the core of the Juggernaut. As the only move to have ever damaged it, it makes sense that this luminescent glow would be one of the things that it would run from. In fact, it was the only reason it had decided to take evasive action in the first place. It was genuinely scared of getting hit by Bell's Argonaut again. Now, although Bell's moves may have seemed calculated, the only reason his firebolt had hit the ceiling was because his immense fatigue wouldn't allow him to absorb the recoil of it. His arm was too damaged to fully take the kickback like how it usually did. So, although it did end up saving them from the Juggernaut, it really was nothing more than luck that the passageway had ended up like this. Now, what the anime didn't show after this was just how close to Mind Down Bell really was here. You see, with that last Argonaut having used whatever mental and physical strength remained, Bell could no longer fend off the desire to just close his eyes and rest. As much as he wanted to pick himself back up, the overwhelming sensation of tiredness was just too inviting for him. So, unless Ryu had gone and called his name in this exact moment, Bell likely would have succumbed to Mind Down and met his end right here. If you're wondering why he was able to push that aside, well, that's because Ryu's soft voice had reminded him of what was at stake here. He was reminded that it wasn't just his life that he was responsible for. With Ryu being at death's door as well, Bell remembered that him passing out would mean the death of both of them, and that was something he promised himself he'd never let happen again. Ever since that incident with Wine, Bell promised he'd get stronger so he could protect everyone. It's a significant part of his development that stems from the events of Season 3. Now, when the Skull Sheep had first made its appearance, its seemingly floating mask had led Bell to believe it was the Grim Reaper first. He thought perhaps death had finally come to guide them to the afterlife. Once its footsteps had revealed otherwise though, that's when Bell finally saw it was a Skull Sheep, an unusual creature belonging to a larger family of skeleton monsters. With their defining traits being their lack of flesh, skin, or organs, the most well-known were the monsters called Spartwa, skeletal warriors whose fearsome strength became known even to the lowest tier adventurers. As for the Skull Sheep in particular, these were typically referred to as Death Hermits, mainly due to the unique way in which they tend to hunt. First, they terrify their prey with the chilling clack of their bones, then they slowly creep up and devour them. They were excellent hunters whose blackened skin allowed them to blend perfectly into the darkness. That's right, this wasn't fur that covered its body from head to toe, but instead folds of skin that acted like a robe. It was the key thing preventing Bell from knowing where its attacks would come from. Since he usually relied on visual information to know when an opponent was to attack, this Skull Sheep was a whole new type of enemy that tested his very limits. Beating it properly would require more than just intuition and fast reflexes. It was after Bell had managed to luck his way out of that too that we then get to his refusal to leave Ryu, a passionate outburst that carried with it the weight of everything he stood for. The reason he was getting so worked up was because to abandon Ryu would mean to stop being himself. It would contradict every single thing he stood for as a person, 
ultimately rendering him unable to rescue anyone ever again. So, when Bell had given all those reasons to keep Ryu by his side, they were actually nothing more than unconscious ramblings intended to convince Ryu her presence was crucial, eventually resulting in the one that actually made sense to them. Ryu wasn't entirely convinced her knowledge of the Deep Floors was necessary, but the decision she needed to make ultimately came down to this. Was it better to free Bell from the dead weight of her injuries, or instead become the brain that would lead him forward? That was the crucial choice Ryu was contemplating here. Now, after giving her first order to find a room, the reason that was so important was because it prevented the spawn of monsters. You see, if they damage the walls and close themselves in, then for a period of time the dungeon won't spawn any new monsters on them. It would instead prioritize repairing itself over creating new ones. So, this was the perfect plan to provide them with a little bit of rest. The thing about that, though, was that Bell was still concerned with what would come after. Like, sure they'd get a bit of rest and perhaps even some energy back, but in the grand scheme of things their situation wouldn't really have improved at all. How would they plan to get back from the deep levels? Would they really be able to make it back to the surface? These were the types of thoughts that Bell's mind was being clouded by. So, as he pushed those to the side in search of a room, it was the following scene with the decrepit adventurers that brought them back and even made things worse. After having their only thread of hope get yanked away so quickly, the mental toll of such revelation was leading Bell straight to the depths of insanity. First he started to hear the skeletons as if they were mocking him, then shortly after he began to hear the dungeon laughing at him. The former was urging him to join them as if it was his fate, while the latter confirmed that that was the only fate awaiting him. Then, as if to fully break his spirit in the most perfect way possible, the light went out bringing absolute darkness and three more skull sheep could be heard approaching from the shadows. It was the perfect storm of events needed to fully envelop Bell in the fear he was struggling just to suppress. So, after panic firing those five shots of firebolt to scare them off, the mental fatigue of doing so had left Bell empty. It took everything within him just to prevent himself from fainting. But with no strength left to even move a finger, Bell was once again ready to give in to the darkness. He didn't remember where he was or what he was doing, but the burden of being trapped in an endless maze made giving in feel so much more enticing, leading Ryu to resort to what we saw in the anime. Now, just as I'm sure you questioned the usefulness of a mere five minutes, so too did Bell think the same. To him, five minutes didn't seem like much no matter how strong of an adventurer you were. But just as he was about to voice those doubts, Ryu answered with words very familiar to those once spoken by his idol. You see, back when Bell had done that training with eyes, she too had mentioned how sleeping anywhere and recovering quickly was important. Bell never fully believed that that was something he'd have to rely on, but after today it was clear that he should have. So more than anything, these next five minutes were about to be a test for him. A test that carried their very lives in the balance. Now, just as how Bell found his merit as an adventurer tested, so too were the Hestia Familia being tested as well. But in addition to the skills and teamwork they needed to apply to this, more than anything theirs was a test of endurance. Since even a concerted barrage of magic wasn't enough to one-shot it, a fight with the Amphis Bino was usually a waiting game. Unless your party was extremely overleveled, the general strat for beating it was to just chip away at it. So, with a party that was both underleveled and undermanned, that put the current group at a seemingly insurmountable disadvantage. Like, not only did they not have a magic user to provide artillery fire from the back, but Welf's offensive sword magic was already at its limit too. That being the case, it was only natural the fate of the party rest in the hands of the casters that were supporting them, specifically Haruhime and the level boosts she provided. By the time we had jumped back into the action in the anime, Haruhime had already cast her level boost three times over. She was rapidly draining potions in order to be ready for when her spell's 10 minute cooldown was up. This was a little bit worrying to Lily, but assuming the Ampis Bina didn't have any special properties like the Goliath Irregular, there was still hope for this monster Rex to be beaten. The only thing they really needed to look out for right now was the blue napalm that could set fire to anything. That and its inability to be put out through natural extinguishing was extremely terrifying. Of course, there did exist remedies that countered it, but with one being a magic potion produced by the greatest healer in Orario, and the other a magic item created by Perseus, Coming into possession of them was extremely difficult. The former was usually only sold to upper tier adventurers, and the latter was more of a secret item limited to use by the Hermes Familia. You see, because the Hermes Familia lies about their level and the floors they've been to, 
they can't just go around buying potions made solely for beating the Amp Espina. So, when Asfi had first come across this two-headed dragon, she had set out to develop an antidote of her own for it, resulting in this item that didn't heal like how the potion did, but it did extinguish flames no matter how strong they were, making that and the potion the only two counters currently available. So, with Lily not being in possession of either, it was only natural she'd want everyone to avoid it. I mean, one hit and it was pretty much game over. Now, with Haruhime's level boost lasting for a total of 15 minutes, that meant there was a 5 minute overlap in which a 5th person could be given a level boost. The actual process was extremely strenuous for Haruhime, but the only thing that mattered to her was everyone's survival. If providing multiple level boosts ensured that that would happen, then Haruhime had no problem pushing herself to the limits to do so. It was an act of determination far different from what Aisha was used to. The young girl who'd once lamented the world she'd lived in was now doing all she could to maintain the new one she'd found. So Aisha was genuinely happy that Haruhime had changed so much. Now, if Haruhime was the support providing all the defenses, then Mikoto was the scout providing recon. Her and her ability to track where the Amp Espina was going was just as useful as Haruhime and her level ups. Combine this with Wealth's ability to create footholds and those would be the two assets providing the upper hand right now. So much so that they were actually making a visible dent to the dragon's health. Whereas it initially started the fight with raging breaths of napalm, its flames were only coming out as ragged puffs now. It had taken so much damage that a normal one would have already retreated to recover itself underwater. Because this Amphispina wasn't a regular though, it ignored its natural instincts to keep itself alive and instead focused solely on slaughtering the adventurers in front of it. So long as there was a chance they could escape, Aisha knew this dragon wouldn't retreat. What no one in the room went to expect though was the desperate move their opponent would try and do next. It was an attack that no one even knew was possible from it. Since all parties would usually fight it in a smaller room with islands, there had never been an instance of a group fighting it in the Great Falls like this. So when it rushed up the waterfall and launched itself down, there wasn't a single person ready to defend against it, resulting in a torrent of damage exactly like how we saw in the anime. When the Amp Espina returned and started shooting napalm everywhere, the reason Cassandra stood still wasn't because she had given up again, but was instead because she had been knocked out by the tsunami. You see, when the waves washed up on shore and brought all the ice with it, Cassandra had used her own body to shield Lily and Haruhime. She had exposed her back and protected the others while they were being washed away. It's not like she was rendered unconscious, but she did take a heavy hit to the back from a chunk of ice, which by the time Lily had helped her recover from, the Ampus Bino was already shooting its fire at them, leading Haruhime to jump in and save them. So, unlike how the anime had made it seem as if Cassandra had given up again, she had actually done quite the opposite. There were no words about being consumed by despair, just zero time to react after having been hit by the tsunami. Now, with Aisha being on the cusp of despair herself, her instincts wouldn't allow her to sob no matter how much she wanted to. As an ordinary person, she definitely felt the burden of losing her friend, but at the same time her Amazonian stubbornness refused to let her show weakness. So, despite her fists trembling with emotion, the only thing to come from it was anger, bringing us now to the end of the episode. But yeah, that's pretty much everything from the second episode of Season 4 Part 2. Before I go, don't forget you can purchase the Armory desk mats from the link in the description. It's a high quality product that really does help to support the channel. I'll also be live later today to talk about the newest episode of Danmachi. We stream every Sunday talking about it, sometimes even give away some desk mats. So if you want to come check that out, then the link to that will be in the description too. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So until next time, ciao!